Amen. Amen. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm glad we have a 15 second delay. Uh, <laughs> well, we want to thank you all for being here today. And it's good to be here. The devil tried to keep that from happening in an in a interesting way, too. You know, we've been attacked by the, the devil on many occasions, knowing it was the devil. He didn't mind telling me it was him. Uh, but this week was a little different, and we just praise the Lord for us being able to be here. And uh, we want to thank you all for coming. We want to thank those who are joining us via the conference line as well as those on the broadcast. We want to say happy Sabbath to you all. And if we would all join together at this time for a word of prayer so we can ask God to send his spirit to not only speak, but also for us to hear. So let's join together for a word of prayer this morning. Our Father and our God, Lord, again, we come before your most holy throne just to say thank you. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your angels of protection, Lord. We thank you so much for this, your holy Sabbath day. And at this time, we ask that your spirit would be present with us. Lord, to turn the pages of your word. Lord, to open up our ears, open up our hearts and our minds to accept the truth that you are telling us today. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us for the sins we've committed against you, even the sin of doubt and unbelief. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for that, Lord, and we could go forward, Lord, and sin no more. We pray for those all over the world who are bowed down now, those who are honoring you as their God. Lord, we ask that you would bless them, especially on this your day. Lord, send your spirit to your ministers so they may speak with power and influence, Lord, so your people may hear and obey. And as always, a special prayer for those under persecution for your name's sake now. Father, we ask that your angels of comfort, your angels of encouragement would be with them now, Lord, in their time of need. Father, so they may continue to look up no matter what the circumstance. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask all things. Amen. Once again, happy Sabbath. You know, tomorrow's not promised. Amen. We have no power to make this, the day come for us. And every day that we get, we should say thank you. We should say, Lord, I don't know why, but thank you. You ever wonder why the Lord keeps you around? You know, considering that we're not the best of people that we're not the best of servants, that we're not the best of humans. But he keeps us around to give us a chance. Yeah. He says, I know who you are. I know what you've done. I know you, you deserve death, but you know what? I love you. And I want to keep you around so you can learn how to love me. And that's a great blessing to have a God like that, right? Let's, if we would this morning, let's turn to the book of Revelation. And it's interesting what the Lord gave us this morning was kind of sort of what we talked about in Sabbath school. At worst, it relates very closely. In Revelation 18, God introduces a command to us that he used since the Garden of Eden. And we need to understand something that it's okay to be a little different. It's okay. Matter of fact, every entity that has ever done anything good on this earth has been different. It has to be different, doesn't it? Because the world has been given over to who? The devil. Amen? So if you're going to do something for God, wouldn't you be different than your environment? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 18. And we're going to read verse 4. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. And it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that re you, ye receive, what? Not of her plagues. He said, Come out of her, my people, because I am going to judge her. The wages of sin is death. I'm about to pronounce sentence on her. I need you to come out. 
because I don't want you to be a victim of her sin. Amen? Now, of course, we're talking about Babylon, right? But, but he's about to come and judge the world in righteousness, and he says, I want you out of this thing because I'm not going to save you in it. I'll save you from it. I'll bring you out of sin. I'll bring you out of her influence, but I'm not going to save you if you insist on being in. So I'm warning you, just like we talked about Abraham, Abraham and when, when God, the blessing we got from the relationship that God had with Abraham is that we found that God would share his plans with Abraham before he did it. Remember the scripture? Should I, he, God said, should I hide what I'm about to do from you, my friend Abraham? God says, you are my friend as well. Should I hide what I'm about to do from you all? He said, no, I'm going to tell you I'm about to rain judgment down on this hell, and I don't want you part of it. He said, come out of her, my people. And this is the message we must teach. We must teach the world, who, those who will hear, it's time to come out of her. And we're not just talking about physically. It's time to come out of her as we live our lives, our m patterns, our minds, our decision making, it's time to come out of her. We have been trained by her and we are in a, a quite an interesting predicament. We're trying to walk with God with the mind of the devil. And he said, you can't do that. He wants you to come out of her. And if you study, let's go to 2 Corinthians. If you study about all the people that God used, that was the command first. Why did they have to come out of Egypt? They had to come out because they were Egyptians in mind, in thought, in deed. He said, if you're going to be my people, you can't be that. Because my system of life and worship does not work in the Egyptian model. And he said, oh, you've been brought up for 400 years in this mess. I've got to bring you out of here and retrain you. That's why he says, I need you to come out now because I've got to talk to you. I need you to, the, 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 all that, what you're doing out here, I need you to leave that alone because I have something for you to do, and you can't do it as an Egyptian. So he always tells us this, and we're going to look at a few examples of how God called somebody out for the same reason he called uh, uh, us out of uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. But we're in 2 Corinthians right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to find out something about our God. Our God really loves us. Anybody have a question about that? I guess they do, Sister One. There's no amens. Nobody thinks God loves them. That's so sad. What a life to lead, and you don't think God loves you. I see why y'all are depressed. I'm, I understand. But let me give you, here's a news flash. He really does. He loves us in spite of us. He loves us when we don't know we need love. He loves us when we're doing wrong, doesn't he? Because if God stopped loving us because we did wrong, we'd be in trouble because we're some wrongdoers, aren't we? But God says, look, I love you, but I want you to do this for me, and I'm going to help you do it. And one thing about God, when he tells you to do something, he gives you the power to do it, and then he rewards you for it. He rewards you for something he did. Isn't that a great blessing? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we want to read verse 17 to start us off, and then we're going to go back a little further up in the chapter. But first, chapter 6, verse 17, God gives this same command through his, his apostle. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and do what? And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He, uh, once again, he was talking to his, this new church, and he says, I, what I need you to do is come out from among them. And literally, I Israel came out from among Egypt, right? And we get down now that we literally going to have to come out to hear him. But God says, you can't come out physically until you come out how? Spiritually. You can't serve a holy God with unholy methods. He said, I need you to touch not the unclean thing. Now, let's, let's look, look a little further up in this same chapter and find out why. Let's go to 14. God commands us, he says, be ye not unequally yoked. What does yoke mean? 
joined together, be not ye un, not un, uh, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be what? My people. He said, what, how do you have a relationship with somebody you don't agree with? You have to stop the relationship you have with the world. Didn't say you had to run away and hide. But you have to stop thinking like the world thinks. You're going to have to start thinking and acting upon God's word and not what the world says. That's why he said, be ye separate. You're going to be separated from the mindset and the spirit of the world. Are we okay with that? And, he, and I, hate, I want to say this by permission. Everybody won't be able to hear this. Everybody's not going to be able to hear this. Because there are a group, 99% of the people on this earth are happy to be normal. What the world calls normal. They're happy to be like the crowd. They're happy to be like everybody else. Some don't want to cause any trouble. Some just says there's too much work to be different. I'm just going to fall in and be with the group. That's the majority of the people. So God doesn't call the majority of the people, does he? Nowhere in this Bible are God's people the majority. Nowhere in this Bible within God's people that the right people are the majority. There was one time there was about two or three, about a million people, when Moses and Joshua and Caleb, three out of a million. But you know what? God is still, uh, was still among them. We're going to have to be ready to be the three, the seven, the twelve, if we're going to do this last thing God asked us to do. See, God is asking us as a church, asking us as a collective body and as individuals to give this last message of warning. Because the world can't give it because the world's still in it. Someone has to call out, come out of her, my people. This is the last message. You got to come out now. Because you know the third angel's message, what that is, don't you? Everybody know? Hold your finger, Second Corinthians. The third angel's message is the message that should should affect your life a little bit. We'll say it that way. We're going to Revelations. Because there's a first, a second, a third, and a fourth angel. But we're going to look at this third angel in chapter 14 of Revelation. In verse 9, if you don't mind. See, Part of this message about coming out of her speaks to this third angel. And the third angel speaks in Revelation 14, verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with the fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. This should get your attention. You should, tr first of all, ask yourself, who is the beast, <laughs> right? And, and, and uh, how, am I worshiping him? <laughs> and God says, yes, you are. And that's why I called and said, come out of her, my people. Because you see the result of those who continue to worship this beast. It's not going to go well for them. And God loves us so much. He gave us this message, not only for ourselves, but also to preach to others, to say, come out of this mess. This worshiping of the beast is not going to work because the worship of the beast is worshiping of my enemy, which is Satan himself. 
And he said, come out of her, my people. He said, because think about it. How can you have a relationship with me and a relationship with somebody else? That's like we were talking about, um, uh, that was Wednesday night. I believe we were going through the commandments and the spirit of the commandments. And he said, how can you be married to me and be married to someone else at the same time? That's adultery, right? Even, even this country won't let that happen. You can marry anybody, but you can't be married to anybody, you know, too many people. No. But you can't do it. He said, what relation? You can't, you can't be with light and darkness at the same time? He said, so if you're going to be mine, which I long for you to be, if you're going to be my children, which I want you to be, I sent my son to die so you can be that, then you got to come out of this other mess. And he's not asking us to come out of something good. He's not asking us to come out of something that's beneficial. He's asking us to come out of the things that are killing us. You would think that would be a reasonable request. But we have to come out here first. We have to say, Lord, I see that your way is better than this way that no matter how many stars and millions and whatever cars and whatever we're working so hard and so diligently for, how many offices we have, and how many, whatever it is, Lord, your way is better. Because I get what they say they're going to give me, but I get it from you, and it's perfect. Did you know how the Lord, the Lord can do that? See, you don't have to win the lotto with the Lord do you? He is the lotto. You just say yay and amen and guess what happens? You don't have to wait on Wednesday's drawing. You don't have to, uh, what is it, Wednesday? I don't want them day. They, they pick twice a week. We don't have to look at the billboard. Oh, I wonder how much is that this week? God said, call upon me. I have it all. He said, I want to give you what you think you want, but I'm going to change your heart so you'll ask me for things that you need. That's how you come out of her. We got to stop listening to the people around us, to the spirit around us, to the cares and the lust of the eyes and the cares of this world. This world is vanishing away as we speak, and we're killing ourselves for it. Anybody remember who worked in your office 50 years ago? No. Why? They died. It doesn't matter anymore, does it? They ain't working there now. But we are fighting for that position. I want to be vice president of all stuff. And when you pass away, they're going to find, oh no, when you have a heart attack because you're killing yourself trying to be there, they'll find somebody else because it, the vice president is not your job. It's their job to let you occupy for a moment. Why are we killing ourselves for this stuff? Why? That's why he said you need to come out of her, and you need to come out of her with your mind. Let's go to the book of Exodus. See, God wants to do something with us. He wants to, first of all, explain what he is talking about, what he is trying to accomplish with us. He said you can't have this relationship and be with me because you don't need it. It's darkness. It's foolishness. Get away from that stuff. Let me do something for you and through you so we can go ahead and wrap this thing up so I can come back and we can spend eternity in total happiness. No one in here has ever realized total happiness. Don't you want to at least give it a shot? We've had little happinesses, haven't we? We've been happy for an hour, but can you imagine eternity? No more fussing, no more fighting, no more issues with children, no more issues with coworkers, bosses, no more test to take, no more nine week test. It'll just be what God asked it to be in the first place. It's going to be wonderful. Assessments. God, you, if you make it to heaven, your assessment has already been done. And you've already got the stamp. Christ put his blood on it and says, approve, let's go. Wouldn't that be great? The last test of eternity. Students ought to be happy about that. Amen? <laughs> let's go to Exodus 11. Teach us too. <laughs> That's what he wants for us. But Exodus chapter 11. This is, at this case, 
another plague was coming because Egypt didn't get the message. So another plague was coming. This was the plague of the firstborn. This was an awful plague. It was a horrible plague. But our God, what he does, he said, I'm doing this so you can understand something. When I tell you to come out, it's a reason. You are different than them. Now we read this in verse, starting in verse 5 in Exodus chapter 11. It says, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Now this sounds like Exodus 18.4. Hey, it's going to be some plagues coming, and I don't want you to be involved in it. He said, but all the firstborn in Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon the throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of the beast. He said, look, there's no social you know, status here. Everybody's going to go because everybody's worshiping the beast. Everybody's on the wrong side of this thing. He said, this is going to happen. I'm sharing this with you, my loved one, so you can come out of her. Now, let's keep reading. Verse 6, and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it anymore. Verse 7 says, but against any of the children of Israel, you know, those who have been set aside for the work of God, he said, shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast for this purpose, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a what? Difference, Difference between the Egyptians and Israel, between the clean and the unclean, between the children of Satan and the children of the living God. God makes that difference. He said, I want to put a difference. That's why I need you to come out of her and stop looking like them. Stop acting like them. Stop thinking like them because you are different. You are my children. Come out of her, my people. Amen? Can people tell who we are by looking at us? They should. What is our testimony to them? Are we, you know, we're coming out, right? But are we looking back? Are we, are we holding on? And say, well, just think about this. If you're telling people, come out of her, my people, and you're walking out, but you're looking back, holding on to some things that are still there, the people who are looking at you are saying, I don't think they're too dedicated to that proposition. They're trying to get back with us. They're afraid of what's out here. Just like Israel was afraid when they left Egypt. All they saw was what? Desert. All they knew was heat. They said, man, some snakes and scorpions out there. It's hot out there. Do you know what God did when he brought them out of Egypt? During the day, there was a cloud over them. I know none of us hung out in the desert. Some of us have been in the desert, but that's not our favorite place to be. It's hot in the desert, isn't it? During the day, it's warm. Guess what? It wasn't hot to them. Why? Because the presence of God covered them. At night, it gets chilly, doesn't it? And, you know, it gets dark because they had no street lights. Remember that? You ever been in the country and it gets dark? It's dark, okay? But in the desert, it's real dark. And that's when all the snakes and all the little critters come out. But guess what happened to God's people? There was a burning flame above them that lit the place up. That's the protection of God. He said, I'm going to show you there's a difference. And when, you, when I call you out, I'm there with you. I didn't call you out to stand by yourself alone with no help from, from above. Here, have some manna. Here, guess what? You've been out here all these years and not, not one snake bite, not one scorpion bite, no sand fleas got in your bed. That's because of, I make a difference. Now, if the Egyptians came out here, they would have a problem. But you are my children. I take care of my children. But I need you to come out of her, my people. So we see this, God says, I make this difference. All great people that you ever read about were separated before they became great. Every one of them. You never saw somebody in the middle of a crowd become great. They learned in the crowd. It's fine to be, you know, like that. 
But God says, I've given you something. Come out here and talk to me. You had to leave the building. <laughs> you had to leave where you were. Is that true? Go to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to read some examples this morning. So you don't think I'm making this up. Because you come to church to hear the word of the Lord. And people who come here who are visiting, they say, why y'all read the Bible so much? Because we don't have anything to say that's better than the Bible. That's why we read the Bible in here. Had an older lady say, you know what? I like the way this works in here because you show people where to look. I said, it's God's word. He shows the people where to look. And they, don't you think you ought to look what God says? And you don't want somebody up here waxing eloquently about something. And then when you leave, you're like, huh? We want to hear what God says. And God says in chapter 6 of Genesis, he said, I call, I call my people out. I make them separate from their environment because the environment is killing them. They can't, they can't reach as high as I want them to reach inside their environment. So I call them out because the environment is always wrong. Let's keep reading. Genesis chapter 6. We're going to start at verse, nine, verse 5. I'm sorry. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Now, if you find yourself in that circumstance, don't you think it behoove you to leave that environment? If everybody is evil, not only evil, every thought they have is evil. If you keep hanging around people who hate, who, who has every thought of their mind is about hate and destruction, what are you going to become? Ask the children. You're a product of your environment. You have been to an elementary school lately? Everybody, only evil continually. The system, only evil continually. You have one or two teachers in there trying to hold on, but they're they kicking them out as fast as they can get rid of them. But look at the children. When you pull one of those children out of that environment and place them in another one, Didn't you go to that school and make all F's and you making all A's? When you pull a man or a woman who wants to follow God out of that environment, see what they can do. Because we are humans. We need encouragement, not just from God, from each other, don't we? And when you're in an environment trying to do right, in an environment of wrong, no one's encouraging you. And there's not many people that can see like David and say, David encouraged himself. There's not many people that can do that. You will get beaten down over time. Anybody had that testimony? And then what happens to us? We get weary. And then we just give up the fight. We just give it up. And we get old and get mad at ourselves. Lord, you showed, you told me that. And I didn't have enough strength to do it. We don't want to be that way. God knows that about us. That's why he said, what? Come out of her, my people. So we, Noah found himself in an in a, in a, in a, in a environment that was only evil continually. And it said, it, verse 6 of 6 of Genesis says, It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. Didn't he say that in, Exodus, I mean, in Revelation 18.4? He said, because I'm going to throw some plagues on this. I'm gonna, we're going to destroy some things because this can no longer exist in its present state. But I'm sharing my plans with my friend. I'm sharing my plans with my child so my child can make a decision to come out. And this is what he was going to share with Noah. He said, uh, and the Lord said, I will destroy, verse 7, man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah did something that no one else was doing. Noah walked with God. He came out of her. In the midst of this perverse generation, he came out. And what did God call him to do? God didn't call 15 people to build this ark. Now, there was a lot of people who built it. 
It was a lot of hands on deck, but God called one. He said, Noah, Noah, you've walked with me. I'm going to share my plans with you, and I'm going to have you to share in the saving of human beings. You, can you handle that one, Noah? What did Noah do? Yea and amen. Yes, Lord. I don't know about a boat. I'm not a boat builder, Lord. Why we need a boat? <laughs> but all those questions were asked as he was doing this. As he was pitch, pitch it within, pitch it without. Go get the gopher wood. Go make it. Th and you know what they do? Today, they build the great tanker ships with the same dimensions as this. Because they said this is the greatest floating dimensions. You know, 300 cubic, you know, the ratios, they keep the ratios. Those big old tankers are built from this. In God, pretty smart. But Noah found grace. He called Noah out. And Noah made a difference, didn't he? Noah was different. Noah was different from anybody else in his generation. God called him perfect. Now be careful about that word. If God calls you perfect, don't you dare tell him that that person is not perfect. But Noah was this, and Noah was that. And you know what? God knew that too, but God called him perfect. God has a different perfection than we do. See, we say somebody's perfect if they meet our standard, as if you would have a nerve to have a standard. Why does dirt have a standard? Dirt is dirt, isn't it? But God has a standard. He says, I look past your faults and your sins because I see my son standing there pleading his blood over you. That's why I call Noah perfect. That's why I call Job perfect because I didn't see Job. I saw Christ standing for Job. And that's what he looks at us. Because every time we say, Lord, forgive us, he doesn't see us anymore. He sees the blood of the lamb and the paid price for the sin. And he says, that's my child. Well, how can you say that, that that's your child? That's just an awful person. They're just terrible. God said, you don't see like I see. Who would you rather have your approval from? God or your cousin? God knows. God knows the heart. God knows the future. God knows what he wants to do with you, doesn't he? And if we would just listen and be willing to be different, he can use us. Genesis 12, another person who was called out. We talked about this fellow this morning. Willing to be called out, willing to answer, and willing to hear. What did he say? Genesis 12. Now, like, like we said, this is not for everybody. Because everybody's not ready for this. Everybody doesn't want this. I, I often ask the Lord, I say, why do you have me in this city? Because this city is built on not wanting to do this. No one wants to be, they're just as happy to be whatever the radio and television tell them to be. And we're trying to teach a message of coming out of her to a people who don't want to hear it. But you know what? He said, stay here. So, okay. For some reason, and I'm looking forward to deliverance, Brother Juan. One day, we might not be here. But the Lord said in verse chapter 12, let's we'll start at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Here we go again. Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You don't know anybody like this. Not only are they blessed, but you know them. That makes you blessed. Those who are good to you, they get blessed. That's how blessed Abram was. Would you like to be that person? That people just come in your presence and get blessed. Why? Because God said, I want to bless you that way. Everywhere Christ, his disciples, you know, Paul could walk through a place and if you stood in his shadow, you'd be healed. Why? Because God said, just walk with me. 
come out from among them and be separate because this is the world God lives in. God lives in a world that nothing is impossible. God lives in a world that the dead rise. God, God lives in a world that sin is pardoned. God sends in the, he, he lives in a world that can make something out of us. He said, don't you want to come out and let's, let's deal with this? Oh, Abram was called out from among his people. He was called out of his environment, wasn't he? Why? Because his environment was evil continually. His dad knew about the Lord, but his dad also worshiped strange gods. He said, Abram, the work I have for you, you can't be in that environment. I need you pure. Come on out of here. And Abram accepted the challenge. And we found out this morning, it took him 25 years before he went from Abram to Abraham, the father of the faithful. You got 25 years. Some of us might not. But God says, I need you to come out because I got something I want you to do. He called Noah. He called Abram. Daniel chapter 1. We just want to make sure we understand this pattern. God uses special people, and the first thing he asks is, says, come out of her. And you know what? It has nothing to do with being rich, being poor, being male, being female. He says, I want to use you if you would answer the call. But we don't want to answer the call. Phone busy. We're on the phone with Skippy. You know, because he's the one trying to keep us from answering the call, right? You know, the devil. He want, he's actually using costume jewelry and convincing you that they're real pearls. And we believe in it, don't we? He gives you a, a fool's gold and you think it's 18 carat. He gives you, what, what, what was the, uh, in the class rings? Uh, he gives you cubic sargonium. That's long years, years ago, y'all. Right? Instead of being a, what, a real a gemstone, real diamond. And we said, ooh, look at that. That is so wonderful. God wants to give me a diamond, but I, I, I don't want a little diamond. You know, this is nice. Yeah, I got the cubic zirconium, and God says, I got a diamond mind I'm trying to give you. But we won't hear. Daniel. Daniel was called out. Let me show you the type of individual God will use. There's a few types of individuals God will use. In Daniel chapter 1, and we start at verse 3, Daniel 1 verse 3 says, And the king spake unto Esphenes, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel. Remember we said you're going to have to learn to be different. Well, when it says certain, these were different people in Israel. See, they, they brought a bunch of folks. But, but for this particular assignment, I need certain. I need specific types. And he goes on to describe the certain type. He said, they should bring uh, of the children, certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was what? No blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldean. He said, look, if the world gets specific about who they want to deal with, why would you think God would? God says, I need certain people. And the first criteria are, is, is this that in them they have the Spirit of God. Remember when they were building the sanctuary? When they were building the tabernacle? And they, he said, go talk to that guy, him, because he's got a lot of skill now. These guys were well skilled in brass and in woodwork. And, but he said, go him because he has my spirit in him. That spirit will make you different. That spirit will take those talents that you have and increase them exponentially. And this is what happened here to Daniel and, and the, the Hebrew boys. They came and got the special ones, the ones that had talent, the ones that had light in them. They used to call them scholarships. How do you get a scholarship? They don't give everybody a scholarship, do they? 
only the best and the brightest are the ones that have, are more likely to follow what they want you to do. You ever heard of a Rhodes Scholarship? Those are the people who they know will make sure that the One World Order continues. They're bright. They don't, you don't have non-bright people going to Cambridge, you know. So if the world does it, God says, I want to do that too. I want the best and the brightest. But guess what? The difference between their system, Sister Wanda, and God's system, he says, I'll make you the best and the brightest. So let's say, oh, man, I, my IQ was 160. Well, I'll make you the best and the brightest. Not in God's world. He said, I'm going to take you. All I need is a willing heart, and I'll make you this. And you'd be like, Lord, I had no idea I was that smart. <laughs> I didn't know I could do that. That's the difference. God says, I want the best and the brightest, and I'll make you the best and the brightest. But you've got to be willing to be different. You've got to be willing to come out of this mess that you're in, this foolishness that you're in, so I can work with you. Jesus wants... Mm, He's trying to separate us from our old way of life, okay? If your life hasn't changed and you haven't separated from, you have not really known him. Because we had a life that wasn't conducive to heaven. We walked another way. And all of us would, should have that testimony, but the second part of that testimony should be, we don't walk that way anymore. He's trying to separate us from that old way of life. He's not trying to necessarily separate you from your family. Now, your family might be really nutty. Your family might be only evil continually. And believe me, a separation will occur. And if you look at yourselves this morning, you are the different people in your family. Any of your brothers and sisters here? cousins, aunties. You all are different, aren't you? Even in your family, you're the weird one. You're the oddball. Your family all may wear red shoes. You would always one to wear green. So you got a little taste of being different already. God says, let me take you up a little higher. He said, I've been protecting you since birth. I made you different than the rest of them. I've been trying to reach you for a long time, but you've been busy. But now I want to call you out so you can do and reach the potential that I wanted for you before you were born. He told Jeremiah that, didn't he? He said, I knew you before you, why, why are you in the womb, man? I made you for this purpose. He's telling you this morning, he has made you for a purpose, and this purpose is to give this last message. Because all of us are ready to go home. Amen. So we see that being, people have been called out. Jesus is trying to do something. Go to the book of John. He's trying to do something with us. He's trying to separate us from the old ways, from the old habits, from the old bottles, from the, from the old cloth. He's trying to separate us from it. Because it's only going to bring us down and limit us as we try to be sons and daughters of God. We're in John chapter 4. God uses people, doesn't he? Do you have to be rich for him to use you? Does he, you have to be, a, 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 what do you call them, a goody two shoes for him to call you. Most people he calls weren't good. What about when he walked through and started saying, Peter, hey, you two on the boat. Mm. Believe me, they weren't saints. Fishermen, in, in, in the area, the environment of fishermen, there are not too many saints. They are, remember the old saying, you cuss like a sailor? Same thing. Then with some cussing, low, I mean, they were gambling, they were a mess. Christ looked past the profession and looked at the heart and said, you come with me. He said, Matthew, you thief, come with me. Zacchaeus, come down. Me and you're going to eat today. Zacchaeus was known, he was a known thief, and he didn't mind you knowing it. 
he still tax you, taxes $10, but you owe me 100 <laughs> And you better give it to me, because I'll call the soldiers. He was, a, he was a loan shark, hustling, no good. Christ said, come down, Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house. Zacchaeus' life changed too, didn't he? So you don't, you, as you are, there's a song we sing, just as I am. That's what he says. That's what I want you, just like you are. I don't want you to try to present to me some facade. Yes, Lord, I am. He said, I know you. Just come as you are, because we got a project I want you to work on. The first project is you. Now, let's go. We went in John chapter 4. Amen? We're going to start at verse 25. Jesus had run into this lady at the well. Now, this lady, you probably wouldn't categorize as a saint. But Jesus met her. Jesus could have gotten water and kept going. But he didn't, did he? He wanted to separate her from her old life. He wanted to use her and be, and, and be part of his kingdom. Let's see how he did this. We're going to start at verse 25. It keeps, uh, keep it short. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh. See, Jesus had been talking to her about, you know, water and, you know, Lord coming, you know. He said, she, she was familiar with the conversation. She said, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, he had told her about herself already. And she said, uh, I'm, 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 I'm hearing something. I'm hearing something. And he said, I'm he that you've heard about. In verse 27, and upon this came his disciple and marveled that he talked with the woman. Why? Why did the disciples marvel that he talked with this woman? Did he, they were trying to see that he knew how to talk? No. She was somebody the church wouldn't dare approach. She wasn't holy enough. And the disciples, see, see why the disciples had, that ish, that had all these issues? Even when Christ was with them, they didn't get the point. They didn't understand love. They didn't understand the, the love of God. Even they walked with Christ and saw the love of God incarnate. They could not get it. They walked and saw him talking to this, this loose woman. Oh, oh, she was a loose woman. She'd been married five times. Oh, Lord, she can't do nothing. But what happened? And, and they marveled that he talked. We're still in 27 of, of John 4. He talked with the woman, yet no man saith, what seeketh thou, or why talkest thou with her? See, they wasn't crazy. They weren't going to just tell Christ, you know, uh, you know, you don't know what you're doing. Because they've seen Christ do a few things, didn't they? You know, he, you know, calm seas, heal sick. So they, they, they didn't question who he was. But in their hearts, they said, why is he talking to this loose woman? He's Jesus, the Christ. Why is he bothered with these awful people? Because these awful people are going to burn in hell and we have nothing to do with him. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? She already started working for him. She had already been called out of her. She would never be married five times again. She, she had been shown Jesus, literally. And what makes her different than us, she believed him. And she, she, she had been looking for him. That's why she had five husbands. She's looking for someone's right. She couldn't find it in a man, could she? But she found it in the man. And that man talked to her and said, I am he. And all she could do, she said, I, I, I got to go tell somebody. And she went and told and said, come and see 
which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Do you see what great evangelistic work this lady did? And she didn't even go to seminary. Matter of fact, she wasn't in the right church the Sunday before last. Christ says, come out of her, my people. That old mindset that had you marry five people, I want you to come out of that because I want to use you. So is anybody too bad for Jesus? If that was a criteria, I couldn't stand here. We couldn't be in here, could we? If we had to live up to the standard that man has made in order to do what God asked us to do, or no, to be called by God, we wouldn't be here. God called us from our sin. He didn't leave us in it. That's why he said, I need you to come out, because your old mindset can't do righteous things. You don't, that old mindset can't do it. You don't know how to do it. Let me show you. He told this lady some things, and that lady, she's probably had a reputation of being a loudmouth, but she used that loudmouth, and she said, come and see, and the whole city came. Let's see another lady. Let's go to the book of Luke. See, I, I don't want anybody sitting here thinking, that's for them. God can't use me. I'm not good enough. God said, just listen and answer the call. I got the rest. Oh, if y'all only knew. Luke chapter 7. I believe it's chapter 7. And this is another lady, okay? People, we had a conversation with somebody last week about women having a role in God's ministry. Women having a role in the church, and they do. They have a precious precious role in the church. And the conversation was that some things you can't do, but some things you can do. And we read in here, women have a huge role in the church. They can do for the good, or they can do for the evil. And we pray that the sisters in here are going to do what? For the good. Amen? Because I'm here to tell you something. We don't want God to have to call you out of here. We don't want anybody to disrupt anything God's trying to do. Brothers also. Amen? Amen. Now, we're in Luke 7. Another lady. <clears throat> this lady didn't have a good rep either. Verse 37. And behold, a woman. No, let's start at 36. <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. What's a Pharisee? Church guy, right? Mucky muck. Church guy. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down at meat. He went to dinner at the Pharisee's house, church man's house, right? So God not only, you know, talked with the, the people of bad reputation, but he also went to the house of people who supposedly had a good reputation. Now, verse 37 says, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a what? Sinner. Now, it was important that they wrote that. Because you'll see how everybody else reacted to her because she was a sinner. Because she was a, a bad person. A known sinner. She had a rep of being a sinner. Okay? Now, he said, a, a, which was a sinner, which she knew that Jesus sat at the meat of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at the feet, I'm sorry, and stood at his feet behind him doing what? Weeping. Why was she weeping? She, she found the Messiah. She said, Jesus is real. I found something that's real. And her heart was melting. Her heart was breaking here. It was, it was a, 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 a transformation taking place. And if you read the rest of it, we won't read the rest. We're going to read some more, but we're not going to read the whole thing. Go home and read this and see. Christ gave a, a parable about somebody who had been forgiven much. Those who forgive much have been forgiven much. They love much. And Christ, he, let's keep reading. He says, and which was a sinner. And she knew that Jesus sat at the meat in the Pharisee's house and brought a, an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with what? tears 
and wiped them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed him with the ointment. His feet with the ointment. Alabaster, expensive, very fragrant, okay? Now, when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, the people who invited Christ to eat saw it, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him. For she is a what? No, he said to himself, he wasn't crazy. He said this to himself. Now, this lady was a what? But what did Christ do for this woman? Later on in the chapter, he said, baby, your, son, your sin is forgiven you. And this lady became a great witness. And she didn't go to Pharisee school. She didn't even go to, in that church. She was in church the next week, wasn't she? Because she found something. She found a savior. And let me tell you something. When we find a savior... When we really find a savior, we're going to wash his feet with our tears too. If you're going, your heart's going to break. And you're going to say, Lord, why? Why would you care about me? How could you love me? I'm but dust. How did, what did David say? How are you mindful of us? We're terrible. And you know what? They make the best Christians. Because they understand something. They needed a Savior. And the Savior was there for them. And the Savior said, what? And he said, and he said unto her, thy sins be forgiven. Just now answer the call. Just come on and walk with me. And let's go to Mark. Because this is important. When I say this lady was a great evangelist, let's go to Mark chapter 14. Because Christ makes a statement about this lady. Mark 14 verse 9. He makes a statement about this lady. We need to hear this. The same statement he made about Rahab. Anybody know who Rahab was? She was a sinner too. <laughs> Rahab had a red light outside her house. Mm -hmm. But Christ said, her name is mentioned in heaven. We, we, we understand what he's trying to do with us. He said, don't let the devil tell you you can't do this. Don't let the devil tell you you can't be separate. Don't let him tell you you can't be special in my eyes because you are. I want to bring you out and be separate because I'm about to rain fire on these other people and I love you so much. Come help me tell somebody. And that's all Christ did at the well. That's all Christ did for this lady who washed his feet because in Mark chapter 14, and we're going to read verse 9. He said, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she, that she hath done shall be spoken of. For a memorial for who? Do you know the angels talk about this lady? You know, the sinner, the one the church wouldn't let in the door. And, and, and they spoke within themselves, why are you talking to this? If you were such a great prophet, you know you would have nothing to do with this awful person. God said, everywhere my word is preached, we're going to mention her. Doesn't that give us hope today? I know some of you sitting in there, what are you calling me? I'm not calling you anything. <laughs> I'm giving you my testimony. God said this, and I've, I've lived this. I lived this. And this is what he did for me. So why wouldn't he do it for you? I know you probably were better than me. Y'all probably were of a, a higher standard of morality than I was. But you know what? That ought to make the trip a little easier, shouldn't it? But he brought me from places that I'm not proud of. And guess what? He gave me the strength not to go back. 
all the habits that he took from me, they're gone now. I don't look back at them. I look back at them to tell somebody who's in that position right now, hey, man, I used to be like that too, man. You ain't got to do that. Come on. <laughs> I don't make a Hollywood production out of it. Hey, man, I used to do exactly what you're doing. Now, what we need to do here, let's, let's go walk with God. Come on, follow me for a couple of days, man. I'm going to show you what God can do. I don't go and say, Morgan, you're a horrible person. It's death to you unless you follow God. Don't you remember who you were? Have you gotten so holy you forgot? Now move on and keep going higher. Don't sit here. Don't say, well, God takes me as I am. He's not going to leave you there, though. He's going to start polishing you up and dusting you off. Yeah, the fire's going to get hot because that's how you purify gold. You have to heat it up. And sometimes your life is going to feel like you're in a furnace, but it's okay. God says, you're in my hand. That flame can't kill you. So there's a memorial for this lady, isn't it? You want a memorial for you? Because it will be one if you walk. You heard of Abraham, didn't you? This, if time lasts, somebody ought to say, do you remember so-and-so? She followed God. Do you remember so-and-so? He worshiped God. That should be your memorial. You should be a walking, living example of who he asked you to be. So someone else may one day say, yes, I saw him do that. And he gave all the glory to God. So maybe my life can be like that too. Let's go to John. We're going to be finished in just a second. But he said, I, I'm not short, shortening his word this matter. We got somewhere to go? Text somebody and tell them you're going to be late. You're not going to be that late. I'm just, you know, don't relax. Just relax. <laughs> Kid's about to have a heart attack. Mm. <laughs> See, there's a message to be taken. And he takes this message with a separated people. You have to be separated in order to be effective in taking this message. Because you can't be in it and give it. You can't have the own mindset, old mindset and give this message. When John, where are we going? John chapter 1. There was a man who had the same message. And if you study the life of this man, you will find out he was separated before birth. God called him while he was yet in the womb. He said, look, you're going to, old man, he talked to his dad. He said, old man, you're going to have a child. And he's going to be the forerunner of the Christ. And the old man didn't believe him. You know, you know what happened to the old man, don't you? He couldn't talk for a little while because, you know, he doubted God. But after the child was born, he understood what his role was. But here's this man. You ever heard of him? He's called John the Baptist. You ever heard of him? John the Baptist had a message to give, and he had to be separated in order to give it. Do you know his diet was different? I know Brother Michael, when his diet different? He ate what? Locusts and honey. He didn't eat fish sandwiches and potato chips and Sprite. <laughs> <laughs> he was separated for a purpose. And we're going to the first chapter of John. Let's go to verse 19. We'll start there. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He said, yes, I'm the one out here in the world. I'm out here talking to people. I'm out here baptizing people, but I'm not the Christ. Verse 21 says, and they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, we got to go back with a report because we want to kill you. But we want to go back, uh, give a report who you, who you say you are. They're going to trap him in his word. Because all John needed to say, he was the Messiah, and they would kill him. But he said, I'm not the Messiah. His answer was this. Verse 23 said, he said, I am what? The voice of one crying in the wilderness. And this is what he was crying. This is his 
message. This is what the message he was supposed to give. Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. The same message John the Baptist gave is the same message we must give today. Make straight the way of the Lord. Let's get all the confusion out of the way about who Christ is. Let's get all the confusion about worship. Let's get all the confusion about the Bible out of the way. He said, I need to, you to show the people the straight way of my word. That's your assignment if you choose to accept it. But if you choose to accept it, you're going to have to be separated. Separated from death separated from sin, separated from pain, separated from, from, from injury, separated from hatred. You're going to be separated from that. Do you mind being separated? And when you get separated, then everybody who you separated from are going to give you the blues. They're going to come after you. They're going to want to destroy you. But you've been separated for purpose. And when at the end of your purpose, whether it be in this life or the next, you're going to receive a crown of glory because he wore a crown of thorns. You're going to receive the things he deserved if you just answer the call. We understand that. Last, no, Malachi. Malachi 4. Malachi. He said, this is the message I want, I want to give you. But I gotta, uh, you got to be separated. you got to give it up. I can't imagine if somebody's struggling, why they wouldn't try something different. <clears throat> and separation is mind. Separation is spirit. Everything about you must be separate. Why do you think John ate locusts and honey? His diet had to be separate. Why? He had to be pure in heart. His body had to be in a condition where he could hear. He didn't, God didn't want a sick man out there preaching because John was rough. John, you, you ever baptize people? We baptize a few people in our lives, and that's a lot of work. Just say you had a 1,000 people to baptize that day, but, you know, you've been eating potato chips and drinking Sprite, and you got arthritis. God said, I need you with me in every aspect of your life. Every aspect of your life. Whether that locust was insects or carrot beans, whatever it was, could have been both. God said, I need you to eat this because I need you to be healthy. I need you to be able to hear me. You know, John, John didn't go to seminary either. John was purposely kept away from there because God had him living somewhere else to learn about him. Now, he came down and, and spent some time in the city so he could know the people. So when he had to go work, he, kind of, he was familiar with them. But John was separate in everything that he did. Malachi chapter 4 is the same message John had. It's the same message we have. And he said in, in, in Malachi 4, we're going to read verses 5 and 6. It says, Behold, I will send you who? Elijah, Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Uh, how y'all doing, Elijah? He wants to send y'all. Because the great and dreadful day of the Lord is right here. And verse 5 says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Hold on. What's that got to do with anything? And what, I thought you said you was, you was going to send Elijah... What are you, now you're talking about family. You're talking about fathers. He said, Lord, what, is, what does that have to do? What, why does that message have to be preached before you come? Because I have set it up that way. We talked about it this morning. Abraham did what? He made sure his whole house knew God. He said, now I'm going to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers. Fathers, return to your children. Children will respond to the fathers. Because if it doesn't happen, he says, I got to come strike the earth with a curse. Why do you think the devil is breaking up fathers today? Why? Because fathers are extremely important in families. 
He said, I'm breaking this devil. said, I got to come at right what God wants to, to them to preach. I'm going to come at them. I'm going to destroy their houses. I'm going to destroy their lives. I'm going to take the fathers away. Anybody seen the result of that? But God said something. He said, I'm going to turn this thing around if you would help me. Anybody know any, any people who who's, they don't know who their father is? Brothers, you know anybody? Need to show somebody how to be a father. Just because you didn't, you know, they're not you. You know, they didn't come from you. Be the father. The world knows how to do that, don't they? They call it big brothers, big sisters. God said, I need you to do this. I need you to show people who I am by being a father. I need you to show who I am by being a husband. I need you to show how, who I am by being in health. I need you to show who I am by walking the way I have prescribed. That's who he's calling now. Anybody want to walk that way? See, not many. And that's good. But God wants us all to. Romans, we'll end with Romans chapter 12. It's not hot in here, is it? I know this has been the longest sermon in the last eight months, but he says, say this. And I don't know why, and I'm not, I'll stop questioning him. After this week, I ain't got nothing else to say. Yes, that's all I got to say. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Here's where it starts. And be not conformed to what? Remember the environment? He taught, called Noah out. The environment, he called Abraham out. The environment, he called uh, um, Dave, Daniel out. He called uh, John out. He called the lady with the, the box out. He called the lady at the well out. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is where it starts. And it has to start with your decision. No one can make this decision but you. No one can walk this way for you. You're going to have to walk it yourself. Don't be afraid to be different. Because, he said, come out. The plagues are coming. The world is about to end. It's about to be real rough here. He said, I want to protect you from that. I want to walk you through this valley in the shadow of death. But you got to come. I can't force you. So it starts with your mind. Anybody want to have the mind of Christ? Anybody want to have the mind not to follow this mess out here? Not to get all worked up about nothing? How many of us get worked out about, worked up about nothing? Nothing. I mean, I know they say it's something, but it's nothing. I have not worried about who's going to be president in the last 25 years. I'm not getting worked up about that. I already know who's going to be president. So who cares? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to worry that, that, oh, you know, that if, uh, 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 if I don't have, if I don't take the flu shot, I'm going to get the flu. <laughs> God says, you don't have to worry about the flu. He said, you do what I ask you to do. AIDS can't touch you. Oh, y'all ain't ready for that one, are you? Oh, man, it's, it's uh, yes, Lord. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. He's wonderful. Amen. Amen. Y'all really need to understand. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful life. That was a movie, wasn't it? Huh? It really is. Just try him. Today, say, Lord, Renew my mind. I don't want to think like that anymore. I don't want to be convinced that the lie is the truth. I want to be able to walk with you. If you pray that prayer, God will give it to you. Anybody want to do that today? Let's all pray. Let's get together and pray right now. And ask God to renew our minds. Because we have a work to do. Amen?
Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, our friend, our protector, our provider, the one that created the universe, the one that knows the very number of hairs on our head, the one who is inviting us this morning to come out and be separate. Father, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for being mindful of us, even in our present state, for they say we are sinners. Father, you see through that this morning. You see something in us, Lord, that we don't see in ourselves. You see something that can be used for the building of your kingdom. Lord, thank you for that. And Lord, we ask that this time that you would forgive us for the sins that are keeping us from you. Forgive us for the iniquities that we hold so dear in our hearts. Forgive us for doubting, being unbelievers, being murderers, being sorcerers. Forgive us, Father. And not only that, Lord, we ask that you give us this strength that you promised, that we would go and sin no more, that we would love you more than we love ourselves, that we would love you more then we love the lust that's in our hearts, the pride of life. Lord, we ask that you would deliver us from that. Give us this mind that you promised us so we may go and be your Elijah, that be your John the Baptist, that be your woman, woman at the well. Help us to do that today. And we'll be careful to give you all the honor and all the praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask all things. Amen.